Okay, they haven't learned it yet, and so I didn't want to give them too many secrets. But teenagers know how to play mom and dad against each other. <laughs> or they try, right? Right? Come on. Come on. Let's hear some honesty here in the room, right? Carlos? <laughs> We, 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 we figure out how to, um, if, if one person doesn't say yes, we go to another person. Uh, you know, there's another challenge with teenagers though, right? What's one of the classic responses that teenagers give when, they ask a, when they're asked a question? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know, right? And, and of course, if that one doesn't work, whatever. Now, have you thought about it? Why, why do teenagers so often use the phrase, I don't know? It's the one to get you not to ask them any more questions. Okay? I mean, it works, right? I know, now I'm letting out some of your secrets. <laughs> it, 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 I don't know. And, 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 oh, okay, well, yeah, you don't know. Uh, now, some of the reasons why a kid, a student, a teenager might actually say, I don't know, is because they don't know. The problem is, is that most of us have already realized that they use I don't know for a lot of other things, so we don't believe them. But, but sometimes they really don't know. And so they actually say, I don't know, because they don't know. And they're, or, here's this one, they don't think you know. And they're embarrassed for you. And they, they don't want to point out that they know something that you don't know, so, so they don't want to say it, right? Or, here's another one, I know. <laughs> but I don't want you to know <laughs> what I know. <laughs> Where were you last night? I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I, I, after I fell asleep, I totally forgot. <laughs> what time did you come in? I don't know. It was dark. <laughs> Who were you with? You know, I don't know. <laughs> so, right? Come on. <laughs> we know, but we don't want you to know, so we don't tell you. Well, you, you're in some kind of tough company. Because you're in the company of the Sanhedrin. Now, who's the Sanhedrin? These are the guys that are in control of the temple. They are the religious leaders for Israel and for Judaism. They are the highest mucky mucks, if you will, in, in Judaism, which then puts them right there at the top. These are the guys who know the law, dot and tittle, in all of its details. They can explain it to you frontwards and backwards. They've memorized it. They wear it on their head. They put it on their wrists. It's on the doorposts of their homes. These are the guys who are going to make sure that you do things correctly when you go to the temple. This is the Sanhedrin, the ruling leaders. They asked Jesus a question. By what authority, by what authority are you doing the things you're doing? Some of you might remember that last week we talked about the fact that Jesus went into the temple and this is the second time he did this. He started his ministry this way and he's doing this again the last week before he dies. He goes into the temple and he cleans it up. It's kind of a nice thing to do, right? Go into the temple, and, and especially since in the courtyard of the Gentiles, there were a whole bunch of animals, so you can just imagine all the mess that needed cleaned up. But it wasn't just animals that were there. It was people that were selling these animals, and they were literally ripping people off, selling them animals. In fact, they would take your turtle dove, which you brought there for a sacrifice, and you traveled many, many miles to make this sacrifice. You brought in your turtle dove, and they'd look at that turtle dove, and they'd say, oh, I'm sorry. But there's a flaw in this turtle dove, and as you know, we cannot give a flawed animal to God. So they take your turtle dove, and then they would sell you a new turtle dove. Of course, now that you're in the temple, it's going to cost you about 10 times as much as your turtle dove cost. By the way, they're going to take your turtle dove, and what you didn't know was they took, took the, and gave you a new turtle dove, they took and took it in and sacrificed it, and, and then your turtle dove, they sold it to the next person <laughs> for, for 10 times what you paid for it. There was, I mean, it was thievery, really, that was going on in the temple. And Jesus comes in, and it's his last week. He's about to go to the cross, and he, he, the night before, he's walked into the temple. He's seen all this going on again, and it's just breaking his heart. And as he's looking at this, he decides, I'm going to clean this place out. So the next morning, he comes back into the temple, goes in there, and he starts turning things upside down, literally. Turning tables over. 
and sending the people out of that part of the temple who were doing all this selling of animals. In addition to that, there are people that are going through the temple using it as a shortcut to get into the city. And he says, oh no, that's going to stop too. All you guys who are trying to go through here with your merchandise to get into the city to sell it in the shops, no! They were never supposed to do it in the first place, but I guess the Sanhedrin forgot that one and a few other things. So these guys that are responsible for the temple and are kinda, they're kind of ticked off, why? Because it was their animals that got overturned, their tables that got thrown around. It was their money that fell on the ground. And, and they felt like, oh, no, that's, what we, that's our money now. And it, it hit them where it hurt. And so, so Jesus clears them out, and he comes the next day. And guess where Jesus goes? Yeah, if it had been you or me, we would have avoided the temple, wouldn't we? Okay, we just made a mess there yesterday. They're pretty ticked off. So we'd stay away from there, not Jesus. Where does Jesus go? Right into the temple, into the very courtyards where he was the day before, and he starts teaching and preaching. And the Sanhedrin, who is pretty ticked off, but they don't want to let everybody know it, comes up to Jesus and says, by what authority are you doing these things? Now, what are they really asking? Who do you think you are? Some people would say, who died and gave and left you, boss? Who gave you the right to come into this temple and to tell people what to do and to clean this place up and to make a mess of it? Who put you in charge? Because, let's face it, it wasn't us, and we're the ones in charge. But they ask it this way. By what authority are you doing these things? And Jesus simply responds, you know what? I will be glad to tell you by what authority I do things. If you can answer a little question. Bottom line, the question was, what was the authority of John's baptism? Was it from heaven or from man? Well, that's a simple question, right? The crowds all know. Scripture's been clear about this. Jesus was obvious. John himself. prophet Elijah come to prepare the way for the Messiah calling the people to repentance and the crowds the crowds believe him the crowds believe finally we have a prophet with us again they believe it if the problem was the Sanhedrin didn't and as far as they were concerned John was a weird guy who ate weird food and dressed weird and talked weird. He ate locusts and honey. He, he dressed in these really wool stuff and he lived out in the desert and they didn't believe that he was, that he was a prophet of God. And in point of fact, what did, what did he say? He said, Jesus, look right there, that's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He said, Jesus is the Messiah. Well, I'm probably moving too fast for you, so let's back up and let's open up our text to Luke, excuse me, Mark, the 11th chapter, the last portion of that chapter. Verses 27 through 33. They arrived again in Jerusalem, and while Jesus was walking in the temple courts, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders came to him. By what authority are you doing these things? They asked, and who gave you authority to do this? Jesus replied, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I am doing these things. John's baptism, was it from heaven or of human origin? Tell me. They discussed it among themselves and said, if we say from heaven, he will ask, then why didn't you believe him? But if we say of human origin, they feared the people for everyone held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus with the classic teenager line. I don't know. And Jesus said, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. The teachers want to know by what authority Jesus is doing this stuff. 
because they're the ones who are the authority of the temple. Literally, they have the responsibility for the temple. These are the guys of the Levitical priesthood. They have been given responsibility that went clear back to the beginning of the priesthood with Moses from the tribe of Levi. And so, and Jesus is not from the tribe of Levi. He's from the tribe, oh, oh, he's a, from the lineage of David, but that's another story. They have responsibility to take care of the temple. It's, they're the ones who watch and see, are you walking too far on the Sabbath? Are you taking, doing the sacrifices appropriately? Are you honoring the Sabbath as you should? And in their opinion, Jesus, who gave you this authority? Because we're the ones who give it, and um, no one here gave it to you. And so Jesus says, well, okay, let, let's talk about that. Who gave John his authority? Bob Deffenbaugh says, one of the primary witnesses to the identity and the authority of Jesus was John the Baptist. There, there's probably no stronger witness to the fact that Jesus Christ is the Messiah than John the Baptist. <clears throat> John 1, 29 to 34. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, a man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. I myself did not know him, but the reason I came baptizing with water was that he might be revealed to Israel. Then John gave this testimony. And what he's gonna go on to talk about is that John had the privilege of baptizing Jesus. Do you remember that? He baptized Jesus. Jesus didn't need baptism for any sin, but, he, but he's getting baptized to begin his ministry to say, I'm committed to God, God the Father. Jesus is getting baptized, and as he's getting baptized, John has been told already, you're gonna know who the Messiah is because you will hear from my voice from heaven and you will see the Spirit descend on him like a dove. Now John, John's heard obviously a lot about Jesus, He's his, related, his cousin. However, for, for John, the evidence is going to come with the, that prophecy coming true. Jesus comes to get baptized by John, and John says, no, I'm not supposed to baptize you. <laughs> You're better than I am. And, no, 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 I have to do this to begin my ministry. Jesus goes under the water with John, gets baptized there in the water, and as he comes up, God the Father speaks from heaven, and John the Baptist can hear it. This is my beloved, beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And he sees the spirit of God descending like a dove on, on to Jesus. Incidentally, side note, have you noticed all the pictures of Jesus from the, from the, the olden times? What do they have around Jesus' head? A halo, right? Right? It's the glow. It's the, it's the glory of God shining on him. And, and, it's, and that's coming down there as, the, as the, 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 this Holy Spirit's coming down like the dove is also part of this anointing that's coming down upon Jesus. And, and it's an amazing and a beautiful moment. And John's seeing all this and he's saying, he's the Messiah. He's, I got it. He's the Messiah. I believe it. And so then he tells his brothers and his friends and his disciples, he says, guys, that's the Messiah. That's the Lamb of God. Go follow him. Now the teachers of the law, the Sanhedrin, have a problem. Did you catch it already? If we say, well, John, yes, John was anointed from heaven. He's a prophet. Well, we're, no, we don't believe that. That would confirm, and in fact, it confirms more. It would confirm the very thing that Jesus is the Messiah because John the Baptist said he was. But not only that, they have another problem because if they, if they say, oh no, he's not from heaven, the whole crowd would probably stone him right there on the spot because they believed, were confident, and convinced John the Baptist was a prophet. So notice, out of fear of the truth, they're not going to answer. Uh, we don't know. They don't believe John's a real prophet. They're afraid of what the people will say. And so instead of facing the people, what do they do? What everybody does when we're caught. Tell a lie. I don't know. We don't know, Jesus. 
We have no idea. I'm sorry. We just, you know. yeah. By the way, who are the Sanhedrin? Aren't these the guys that are paid and they live their lives to know when things are from God or not? Isn't that like their, their main responsibility is to understand, is this from God or not? Is this God's truth or not? That's their job. And they're like, we don't know. Kind of like a teenager. In the biblical illustrator, it says, let us pause to take in the full meaning of his searching, indignant gaze. Kind of, kind of picture Jesus here. He's looking at them and he says, really? You want to know my authority? Well, what about John? And then he just kind of stares at him because he knows what's coming. Take a look at his indignant gaze, you. It seems to say, you who question my authority are the religious teachers. It's your business to know about spiritual things, to judge between the things of God and the things of man, to judge spiritual and carnal conduct, to protect religion, to guard the temple, to be the ministers and stewards of the mysteries. Is that so? Isn't that your guy's job? Well, then let me see. If you are fit for such duties, if you understand the things of God, then, then tell me who is John. And if you do, then you'll have a right to question my authority. Jesus is really saying to them, prove to me that you have authority to even ask me what is mine. In the critical commentary of the New Testament, E.P. Gold says, we must remember just what is involved in that refusal to respond. These were the constituted authorities in both civil and religious matters, and Jesus' refusal to submit his claim to them is a denial of their authority. He says, okay, if you're not going to tell me, I'm not going to tell you my authority. By the way, he's told them his authority all along the way, hasn't he? Has Jesus kept his authority hidden? Not at all. Jesus has constantly been at this temple teaching and speaking and, and doing things, even doing miracles, getting in trouble for them, yes, but doing things that proved his authority. Again, Bob Deffenbaugh says, the reason that many reject Jesus as their Messiah and Savior is that they place themselves above the authority of the Word of God. They trust in their own reasonings rather than in divine revelation. The fundamental question one must face in deciding about Jesus Christ is, what is my ultimate authority? How sad it is that many spend more time and effort in choosing a laundry detergent or a television than in considering the claims made by the scriptures concerning Jesus Christ. Jesus revealed his authority by his very teaching. Scripture says that because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. <laughs> That's the Sanhedrin. Luke 4, 32, they were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. They were powerful. Mark 1, the people were amazed at his teachings because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. The people were also amazed that they asked each other, what is this, a new teaching? And with authority, he even gives orders to impure spirits, and they obey him. In fact, Colossians 2.15 says, after he had disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them. How? By triumphing them over them on the cross. He demonstrated his authority by his teaching. He demonstrated his authority by his power to forgive sin. I want you to know, Jesus said, that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he says to a paralyzed man that's laying out on this mat that's been brought and laid down before Jesus. And right in front of Jesus, he's asked the man, do you want your sins forgiven? They're already getting upset about that one. And he says, okay, to show you that I have the power to forgive sins, get up and walk. And the man gets up off his mat, grabs a hold of it, and starts walking out of the room. The miracle there was that Jesus had the power to forgive him not just that the man walked. Jesus had authority not only to, in his teaching and not only to forgive sins, but Jesus had authority over demons and powers and nature itself. What happened when they were in the middle of the storm? 
And Jesus is asleep in the front of the boat. And the disciples are getting all scared. Jesus, we're going to die. How can you be sleeping? Aren't you afraid for us? Get up here and worry with us. Cry or something. And he gets up and says, just a minute. Storm, be quiet. What's your problem? <laughs> um, I think we have a bigger problem right now. What did you just do? And the scripture says it kind of in a little bit different way. It says it's that they were all scared and they fell down on the bottom of the boat and they're like, you know, who is this man that he controls the wind and the waves? And another time they're out there on the boat and they're also afraid again. And, and he starts walking by them and, and somebody sees, oh no, it's a ghost. Oh no, it's Jesus. Well, if it's really you, Jesus, tell me to come, Peter. Jesus says, well, come on, Peter. It's fun out here. <laughs> Jesus gets out, Peter gets out of the boat. Starts walking out to him until all of a sudden he realizes that people don't walk on the water and he starts to sink because he's looking down and saying, I'm in big trouble. I'm walking on water. I'm not supposed to be here. And he starts to sink and he says, Jesus, save me! Yes, Peter. And he reaches down and grabs him. You know, what, why were you afraid? What, what happened to your faith, Peter? Jesus has power. He stops the waves and everything, calms everything down and gets Peter back in the boat, drives him off and says, Jesus has power over nature and, and miraculous things. He, he healed the sick again and again and again. In fact, one, one example, and this one is really a significant one, a, a lady's got her son, her only son, he's already died, and they're carrying him on what they call a beer, a, a stretcher kind of thing, because they're carrying him out to bury him, and they, and they do that almost immediately. And, and they're, they're carrying him out the city, and he's outside the city gate, and Jesus says, stop, stop, what is this? My son, he's dead. She's crying away, and Jesus reaches over, talks to the young man, tells him to get up. And he gets up and rises from the dead. Luke 7, the dead man sat up and began to talk, and Jesus gave him back to his mother. And they were all filled with awe, and they praised God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. Amen. This news told him about all the, excuse me, about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. John's disciples told him about all these things, calling two of them. This is John now. John is in prison. We'll, we'll call it that. He's in a cell, a dungeon kind of place. Herod's got him there, kind of having, using him for sport right now until he's going to kill him. John's in this dungeon, and, but he knows he's about to die, and he's getting, getting concerned. What if I preached and did all this calling people to repentance, and what if Jesus is not the Messiah? What if what I did was for nothing? I've pointed to you, Jesus, and what if you're not the one? And so he asked two of his disciples. Some believe that one of those was John, the, the, the disciple, the beloved one. The two of his disciples... He sent them to the Lord to ask, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? And when the men came to Jesus, they said, John the Baptist sent us to you to ask you, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? At that very time, Jesus cured many who had diseases, sicknesses, and evil spirits and gave sight to many who were blind. So he replied to the messengers. Now notice, this is the evidence that Jesus is the Messiah. This is the evidence that's going to help John the Baptist go ahead and have his head beheaded, have it removed from his shoulders. This is what's going to give him the confidence to go forward. Here's what Jesus said. Go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. You've seen the miracles. You've seen people. In fact, he says it. The blind receive sight. They've seen that. The lame are walking. They've seen that. Those who have leprosy are cleansed. <clears throat> the deaf hear. <laughs> that guy over there was just raised from the dead. Tell him what you've seen and heard, and the good news is being proclaimed to the poor. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Jesus had authority over demons. He, he had authority over nature. Jesus could forgive sin. Jesus taught with authority, and Jesus gave that authority to the disciples. 
He sends them out in groups of two. And he says, look, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bless you and I'm going to anoint you with authority to go out, heal the sick, <coughs> cast out demons, and proclaim the Messiah's coming. Preach repentance. Go do that. And guess what? They go do it. It happens. They heal the sick. They cast out demons. People are coming to believe in Messiah Jesus. And they come back and they report all this to Jesus. It's wonderful, Jesus. The demons even listen to us. And the, and, the, and the sick were healed. Jesus, this is incredible. Oh, no, no, no. What's really incredible, Jesus says, is that your name is written in the book of life. That's what really matters. Jesus gave his authority to disciples. He said, I, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. In Matthew 10, Jesus called his 12 disciples to him and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. In Luke 10, 19, I've given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Now, please don't start a new cult where you're going to go out and step on scorpions and try to find rattlesnakes. And I, there's already some groups like that, okay? And, and they're just weird, okay? That's not, that's not what Jesus was trying to set up. But what he was saying is I'm giving you the power, the authority to stand against evil in your day. Whatever that evil might be. And to have victory over it through the power of my spirit that I'm going to give to you. I'm giving that to my disciples. Now here's a big problem though. Our world does not value the authority of Jesus Christ. And we are growing in our distaste for the authority of Jesus Christ. Now before you point the finger too much out there at the world out there, you need to examine what we are doing inside the body of Christ. The word of God is very clear on many different issues. Let's take one little simple one. Is sex a gift from God? Not a curse, meant to be a gift. And how is sex meant to be used? For our fun and pleasure, whenever we want it, where, however we can get it, as long as it's free and safe, right? Some of you are like, I'm like really concerned about Pastor Bill right now. <laughs> Because what I just described is the way the world thinks about it. And what's really sad is that too many of the body of Christ are thinking the same way. So now in, in our culture, Barna just did a research project on this, and in our culture, more Christians believe that you should live together with somebody before you marry them. Really? So we're going to test drive that other person before we marry them. How many are we going to test drive? And how, how are you going to know? Because once you've test drive, driven it, now it's used. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff to go down that road, but I'm just trying to point out this. Folks, we in the body of Christ need to watch out because we also are no longer holding to the authority of the word of Jesus Christ and what he's taught. And we need to examine ourselves. And look at where we're vulnerable before we look out there and say, oh man, that world's getting really messy because they don't believe in God anymore. Like, look, we don't, we don't pray before things. In fact, if you pray, you can get in trouble. And, and so, uh, look, we're, we want to try to take God out of everything, the, the schools and everything. And, but oh, can, can I just say one comment, quick comment on that one? Can you take prayer out of the public schools? There ought to be a big, 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 big no. Unless Christians stop praying in the public schools. And I'm not talking about in big meetings. Can a little girl in her classroom as a kindergartner pray? Hey, lots of high schoolers pray. Especially when it's time for the final they didn't study for. God, help me to do, some, do well and better than I studied. God, please help me. On this. Matthew 11, 25. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, 
Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The world may not believe in the authority of Jesus. The Sanhedrin did not believe in the authority of Jesus. And the world may respond, you know, well, tell me about Jesus. I don't know. Tell me about God. I don't know. Just like the Sanhedrin. We don't know, Jesus. We can't say uh, where John got it from. Well, then, you know, you don't deserve to know my authority. The bottom line is Jesus had authority in his father's house. Amen. He's at the temple. It's the place of prayer. It's the place where he said, you should, anyone should be able to come here and speak to God. It's a house of prayer for all nations. So that's why here in the place of the Gentiles, in the courtyard where the peoples of all nations are allowed to come, that's why they should be able to come into that place and be able to speak to God. And he says, that's the authority I have is to make my dad's house a place where people can talk to him. My authority is from my father. And folks, the good news is Jesus gave you the same authority. You have the same authority to go into the holy of holy places. Not because you're perfect, but because of Jesus. You have the authority to speak to God. In fact, you have the authority to go out and make disciples. Here's how he said it. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go. The authority I have, I'm giving it to you guys. And he didn't stop with the 12, excuse me, 11 disciples. It's for all of us. We have authority to go out and make disciples of all nations. By what authority? By what authority do you answer the questions of the world? By what authority do you speak to somebody else about what they should do? By what authority do you give your opinion and give your advice to somebody else? Are you giving it on the authority of the word of God or on the authority of you, you? Folks, we have authority, like Jesus, to clean the house. Start with yours. We have authority to enter the holy place. And this one you might not be comfortable with, but we have authority to cast out evil and don't need to be afraid of demons. So my question to you this morning, do you have authority? Please don't answer, I don't know. Because what happened to the Sanhedrin was Sanhedrin, Jesus said, since you don't know, since you're not going to say, then I'll stop talking to you. There's a reason at his trial, by the way, this is Wednesday, there's a reason why at his trial on Thursday night, he was silent. He's not going to talk to those who don't want to know his authority. What's your authority? And are you making use of the authority that Jesus Christ is giving to you?